So good afternoon, ladies and gents. Uh, a few words about myself. Uh, my name is Shandor Namesh. I work as a senior security researcher for FireEye. I mainly do reverse engineering, threat research, occasionally some coding as well. And just to make our lawyers happy, uh, a small disclaimer that the views expressed here are my own and do not necessarily reflect the opinion of my employer. So let's get started. Probably all of you have seen these awesome looking cyber threat maps on the internet. A few years ago, it was a big hype among ID security companies to roll out their own version of these cyber threat maps. These usually have various graphics details, like some of them are displaying the target country, the source country as well. Some of them are more uh, antivirus detection focused. Some of them are network data focused, like they show the port number, the IP address, and so on. These can look really cool, especially if someone walks into the office and this is shown on a big screen. But to be honest, this is more of a performance art, so its practical use is kind of limited. Uh, nonetheless, they are still very cool. So companies use various data sources to build these uh, cyber threat maps, depending on their area of business. For example, antivirus companies use their AV detection data at the endpoints, at the customers, Network security companies use their network sensors and so on. Um, one of the interesting data sources that can be used to build these maps is bot emulators. And I'm going to briefly describe what these are in this talk. So these bot emulators can not only be used to build great looking cyber threat maps, but these can be used to extract useful information from botnets and from threat actors that are behind these botnets. So probably not all of you do malware research as their daily job. So I will quickly describe what botnets are, just as a recap. So botnets are private networks of computers which are infected by some kind of malware. Usually we name the botnet after the malware family that is infecting the machines. And these are controlled as a group by someone called the bot operator or the bot herder without the consent of the owners of those machines. There are two main architectures. The first one is the classical uh, client-server model, when there are one or more command and control servers. These are often abbreviated as C2 servers or CNC servers, and these communicate with the clients. The more advanced version is the peer-to-peer -peer botnet architecture, where clients directly communicate with each other to relay information to their final destination, uh, and they can dynamically select a server uh, from one of the clients. It's important to know that not all malware families can form botnets. Usually financial malware uh, can form botnets because they maintain a persistent communication channel with the clients and they keep asking for information and sending commands and so on. Other malware families like most ransomware families, they do not form botnets because after they encrypt your hard drive, they might send some information to the server saying that, hey, I'm a new infected machine. But after that, they don't usually keep up the communication channel. These botnets are usually controlled using a web-based panel. Uh, on the screen, you can see, I don't know how much you can see that, but you can see the panel of a malware family called Formbook, which gained some popularity in the last couple of months. And you can see on the bottom of the screen that there are two infected machines. One of them is active, one of them is offline. And on the left-hand side, you can select the commands that you want to send to these, to these machines. Like you can execute a file, you can download a file from a URL, and so on. So uh, first, I would like to clarify that bot emulators are not something that we invented or discovered. So several ID security companies focused on threat intelligence do this. So this is nothing new. But how can we extract data from these botnets? So in order to become part of a botnet, we need to infect the machine with, with the malware. So obviously, if you have a good malware sample set or a good malware sample feed, that's a good start. There are several open source and private feeds, so if you look hard enough, you can download malware from the internet easily. We're mainly interested in data that we can use to uh, find out who are the threat actors behind these, not necessarily to identify who they are, but to link certain malware samples to basically groups, threat groups, 
And uh, we, also we are also interested in information about the targets, the victims, the targeted countries, regions, industries, or companies. There are three basic steps to do this. First, we need to identify the malware family. Then, if we have that, we can use scripts to extract data from the malware sample. And then we can use this data to emulate the bot's communication and get information from the server itself. So identifying the malware family seems like an easy task, but it really isn't. So if you ever try to upload files to VirusTotal and look at the results, uh, probably there were cases when you saw that the antivirus vendors couldn't agree on a malware family. So some of them describe it as a certain family and some others describe it as some other family. Uh, the reason behind this is that almost every malware sample is packed using some kind of runtime packer or cryptor, which makes it almost impossible to determine the family name just by looking at the file itself or the file contents. These cryptors are often also reused between families. So AV vendors might create a detection on a malware cryptor because they know that this is only used with a certain family, that later that cryptor might be sold at underground forums and other malware families might start using them as well. So this can cause some confusion. Another problem is with malware downloaders, which are scripts or malware families whose whole purpose is to download a file from a URL and execute it because the AV companies, which use dynamic analysis systems to find out the behavior of this malware, have a hard, hard time to uh, separate the behavior of the downloaded file from the file that downloaded the actual malware. So in this case, uh, not sure how much can you see that, but there's a malware family called Ferret, uh, also known as Pony Loader. That's a downloader kind of malware. So it might have happened that uh, a Ferret sample downloaded a Formbook sample that you can see here, and other AV vendors might have uh, hit on that signature. So that can cause some confusion as well in the detections. So after you have the precise malware family identification, uh, you can use dynamic analysis systems, uh, otherwise known as sandboxes, to look through the packer or crypto layer. So we do not need to actually unpack the file and reconstruct the original executable file. We just need to uh, look through this layer to be able to find the information that we need. One of the most well-known sandbox systems is Cuckoo. Not sure how many of you are familiar with that. Uh, it's a good open source tool. Uh, currently, it's, uh, the latest version is 2.0, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So you can use this to uh, run the files and basically use some of the, these two approaches to get out the configuration from the, from the sample. So the first approach is creating process memory dumps triggered by certain events. These events can be a freeing memory page or termination of a process, or there are products that trigger this uh, on the first network event. So when one of these events happen, uh, the system saves the memory dump, the certain memory ranges or the entire process memory to disk, and you can use simple scripts to extract the configuration from there. Uh, you can think about these scripts as like scripts written in a high level language like Python. It can be anything, really. Uh, these, this process memory dump approach unfortunately doesn't work if the malware overrides the memory after, uh, after extracting or decrypting the configuration. Uh, so it might happen that the malware allocates a memory page, puts the configuration there, and before freeing that memory page, it basically overrides it with zero, so we, we lose the configuration. Uh, the other approach is creating full virtual machine memory dumps. Usually these are done at the end of the malware analysis. This results in one huge dump that's one or two gigabytes, depending on the uh, amount of memory in the machine. The drawback of this method, that this can be used if the malware doesn't execute properly. So if the malware crashes or uses some kind of anti-VM stuff, uh, usually the process will quit and it won't appear in the final memory dump. Uh, but the benefit of this method is that you can use standard memory forensic tools to get out the configuration from the, from the dump, like volatility. So this is how an extracted configuration looks like on the screenshot on the right-hand side. This is from a malware family called DreamBot. That's a variant of the Gozi financial malware. You can see that 
there is several interesting information that we can get out of the sample. We can get the build date and the version number, which is really useful to track the development effort that goes into uh, updating this malware family. So if you see a major change, then we can reanalyze the malware and see if there's any new edit capability. Usually there are also encryption keys in the configuration. Uh, these will be important later because this allows us to decrypt the configuration uh, and the network traffic, for example. We can see botnet IDs and campaign IDs. Uh, that's very useful to uh, track the groups behind this. So if you see two malware samples and both are used the same botnet ID, that means that probably they came from the same thread group. And of course, we can see the command and control servers, uh, which are very good indicators of compromise. If we are successfully able to extract the configuration from the memory dumps, that also confirms that our family identification was correct. Unfortunately, these extractor scripts break pretty easily because malware authors constantly update their malware. So we need to, every now and then, uh, uh, look at them and maintain uh, the scripts. So what else can we do with the command and control servers in the configuration? We can emulate the bot's communication. And by emulation, I do not mean CPU emulation that's done in the virtual machines. So only the communication is emulated. So these are simple scripts as well that try to communicate with the servers. This way we can pretend to be an infected machine and we essentially become part of the botnet. Uh, usually this is preceded by a very good amount of reverse engineering effort, depending on the malware family that can last from several weeks to several months. Uh, because there are various levels of complexity, uh, like there are some malware families that use standard protocols like HTTP. In these cases, we just need to find out what are the URL parameters, what encryption they use, and then just uh, reverse engineer that. For other malware families, like there was a malware family I worked on a few months ago. It was called Corbot that used a custom binary protocol. So in this case, basically you need to reverse engineer the protocol itself as well, and that's much harder. What, what are the data that we can extract uh, using these emulators? First, we can see the commands that are sent by the server. Uh, we can see what they want to download, what they want to execute, and so on. We can see updates to the configuration, which is useful because sometimes they send updates to the command and control servers as well. And of course, we can see new malware samples and not necessarily only, this, only the malware family that was infecting a machine. Sometimes they send other malware families as well and distribute that using the botnet. Uh, in this case, we can restart the cycle and analyze the malware family again and extract the configuration from that sample as well. We also see web injects, which is, not sure if everyone knows what web injects are, but this is used by financial malware to uh, tell the bot what data to inject to banking websites in order to be able to steal the credentials. So let me show you how these web injects look like. Uh, this is from a malware family called Corbot. Um, you can see that there are two URLs uh, in red rectangles. Uh, these are Canadian ba banks. The first one is Desjardins. The second one is the Bank of Montreal. So when the user types in this URL into the browser, the bot searches for the string that comes in the data before field, and then inserts the HTML elements or JavaScript code that comes in the data inject field. So this way they can basically change the UI elements of the banking page, add JavaScript code, redirect the traffic, and so on. This is very important to us because we can see which are the targeted banks. And uh, from that information, we can imply what, what's the targeted region. Uh, this inject file only contained uh, Canadian and US banks, so it was operand that this is targeting North American countries. There are other uh, malware families that are targeting German-speaking countries or Eastern regions like Japan and so on. So emulating bot communication has its own challenges. Uh, obviously, we can't use the same IP address for all our bot emulators because that would raise the suspicion of the bot operator that all the victims are connecting from the same IP address. Uh, we emulate a lot of samples, like thousands of samples at the same time. So we need to maintain a big uh, pool of IP addresses through the Tor network and VPNs as well. 
And sometimes we receive malicious commands, and we obviously do not want to implement these and do not want to uh, do these. Like a botnet can send a command that, hey, send a spam email to these email addresses. We just silently skip those commands and do not send them out. Uh, botnet families usually do a pretty good amount of fingerprinting on a victim machine as well, because they want to know if this is a real machine or an analysis machine. So sometimes they uh, ask for system information like computer name, username, even the screen resolution or the process list or the list of windows that are actually on the screen. So we need to make sure that this data is credible and we cannot hard code usernames because that would be kind of suspicious. So we have to generate a fake username, a fake computer name, a fake task list for every emulator that we run. Um, sometimes a funny thing happens when the bot operators try to send screenshot commands to the emulators. And because these are not actual virtual machines, only just scripts, we obviously cannot send them screenshots. So uh, there are several options how to handle these. The easiest one is to just keep these commands and do not answer. Uh, so I imagine the bot operator that he's angrily pressing the screenshot button and wonders why it doesn't work. Uh, he might think that this is a bug in the malware. Um, a bit better option is to send black images that matches the resolution that we reported to the malware. This is a better option because the bot operator at least gets something, only a black screen, so he might think that the user is running some kind of full screen application or there's a bug in the screenshot code uh, and that's why it doesn't work. And the best option would be uh, to generate actual screenshots of, of a desktop. This is a hard problem because uh, the screen resolution must match the resolution of the screenshots and it must also match the task list and the window list that we previously reported to the malware. So if we report that the Chrome is running, we obviously have to have a Chrome uh, window on the screenshot itself. So it's not an easy task. A good example uh, of these challenges is the Emotet malware that doesn't give you any data or web injects until you provide some stolen passwords or some data from the client. Uh, the same problem that we had with extractors uh, appear, appears here, that these families are constantly changing. They do not necessarily try to break our emulators on purpose. They just add new encryption methods or just implement new commands on the server side. And uh, this can break our emulators silently without we knowing about it. So we need to occasionally maintain these and update as required. So the key takeaways of this short talk is that the information extracted from these malware samples can be later used to emulate the bot communication. And emulating the bot communication can be useful to track the threat actors behind these and seeing what was the region that they target. And this can be especially useful for banks and financial institutions because usually their customers are the victims of these attacks. And their security teams can then have a better understanding of how these threat groups operate and how the families uh, uh, work and what are their capabilities. Thank you very much. Any questions?